All right, welcome everybody to week 14, day two. We're gonna go over the midterm uh, from last week right now, and there is an Irish music X credit workshop tomorrow, four o'clock here on Discord. And uh, if you can't make it, watch the recording, write a one page essay on what I talked about. All right, so this is the results of the midterm. Nobody got below a 55%, so that's pretty good. Uh, you see it's a bit of a bell curve, uh, around, around 80%. Okay, so um, first part of it had a bunch of like conceptual questions, and um, and so basically, you know, it's, I can't like make you guys make a super scalar CPU. So the best I can do is just ask conceptual questions. And so if you have multiple functional units, that's called super scalar computing. In this case, adding a second ALU. Um, dual issue means that it can push out two instructions at a time per cycle. One cycle, two instructions go out. So if you have two adds that don't depend on each other, push them out to the two ALUs. Um, not pipeline, not overclocking, not neon. Okay. Suppose you do add a second ALU and make the CPU dual issue. What is the most likely result? So uh, an ALU doesn't do floating point math, right? So nine of you pick that. Um, ALUs don't do floating point math. That's what the Fresno Pacific University is for, right? The FPU. The um, FPU improves floating point performance and ALU does uh, arithmetic and logic. That's AL, right? Integer arithmetic and logic and or not, that kind of stuff. Reduction pipeline stalls. Um, Probably not actually, because it, it, do, it doesn't help, right? If there's a dependency between two instructions, making a dual issue doesn't help with that. It can't do out of order execution or whatever. It's it's just like, if B depends on A, it can't dual issue them. It, it, there's still gonna be a stall. And um, so yeah, increased in, instructions per cycle for addition. All right, <clears throat> so uh, the number of instructions per cycle is the the metric that we try to boost these days and by we i mean not me because i don't make cpus i have not made a cpu since the 90s and that was um for a class i don't think it really counts it worked though it was pretty cool um it's really neat watching you know you load up firmware rom in an assembly language you made and have the cpu grab x number of bits at a time out of it parse them, figure out what instruction it is, update the registers. Like it's, it was a really cool project. It took an entire quarter to do, but I had a working CPU. It's pretty cool. Um, but what we've been trying to do is boost IPC. Clock rate is not really going up too fast these days. Um, you know, 10 years ago, you could have a four gigahertz processor. Today you have a four gigahertz processor. Eh, you know, there's not been too much progress. It's probably a little bit faster these days and not, not too much. Um, the, the big, the big gain in speed in CPUs is from IPC instructions per cycle. Okay. What kind of, and I'm, I'm using terminology here so that to demonstrate you guys know the lingo, right? I, I hate lingo and I, and jargon and things like that, but this is a midterm. So I want to make sure you guys are capable of keeping up in a technical conversation because this is how people talk. We don't say the arithmetic logical unit. We, we say an ALU. Okay, what kind of dependency is this? Uh, so these guys are writing to R0. This guy's writing to, okay, all of you know that. I don't have to go over it. It's right after right. <clears throat> if we bitwise or these guys together, um, you, you can just do the bitwise or in your head or you should be able to. Uh, F is just one 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 zero 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 zero. So the middle two digits are going to be Fs because um, if you or anything with true, you get true. And then the first letter is going to be F as well because F or with zero is F. Okay. XOR. So with XOR, if you get two trues, you get a false. Uh, otherwise, it's the same as or. And so you can think of it as bit flip. So anytime you XOR something with one, it flips the bit. Anytime you XOR something with false, it leaves it alone. 
So what we have here is true ord with false. So we're going to have a true, a true ord with true. A true ord with true is going to be false. And then a false ord with true is going to be true. So most of you guys got that. Match a number with the value holds a decimal. You got that. You got that. You got, hmm, octal. <laughs> octal. Octal. That's octal. If you start a number, if you start a number with zero, that's an octal number. If you start a number with zero B, it's binary. Zero X is hex. Zero is octal. And if you don't think that's a bug that has gotten me, you'd be wrong. Because um, sometimes I would want my numbers to line up nicely. You know, so to have like 10 and 20. And then for the first one, I just write zero, zero. Um, technically zero also, but if you do that for like other numbers, uh, you will be grossly disappointed. So yeah, starting a number with a leading zero means it's octal. Probably not the best uh, thing in the world. And then that's just decimal, which you guys got. Okay. That's your concept of why we do it. Pipelining boosts your throughput. So the number, if you look at the total, a total chunk of time over time, if you have a pipeline CPU that works well, you're going to get more instructions done. Kind of like that laundry thing, right? Um, in the same amount of time, it, it doesn't help with one instruction, but over a span of time, it'll have more loads of laundry going through. Uh, uh, Superscalar execution, um, if you can have multiple commands running at the same time, that's going to boost your performance. Higher clock speed boosts your performance. SIMD is neon. Um, SIMD is neon, so you can do four instructions at the same time, or eight or 16, depending on how much parallelism you have in your SIMD code. Uh, NISD is the uh, one like when you have CPUs voting. You have CPUs voting on what they should do, multiple instructions on single data. So like the three CPUs will vote to turn on the rocket. And if they agree, the majority rules, you know, um, if one of them disagrees, then you get what's called a minority report. And then Tom Cruise discovers there's a minority report and it just causes the whole pre-crime division to unravel. All right. So out of order execution allows you to navigate around pipeline stalls. Um, if there's going to be a, a pipeline stall, you can, you know, find things that aren't dependent and put them up there. That'll give you better performance. And uh, speculative execution, an awesome movie. Yeah, I, I'm not really a huge fan of Tom Cruise as an actor, but I, I did, I did really like Minority Report. Um, I like, I like action movies that kind of make you think. Terminator, you know, is a great example of that, right? Terminator Two, Terminator, action movies, but you know, they like you have to, like, wow, you know. I don't know if you guys, if, if none of you guys have seen, if any of you guys have not seen Terminator or Terminator Two, you should definitely watch it. Um, it definitely has some thought-provoking stuff in it. Matrix, you know, same thing. Speculative execution, if you get a branch, you can guess, okay, we're going to go this way. And if you get it right, then there's no performance penalty. So if you don't have speculative execution, you have to just wait for the branch to execute. And then you can go that way. So speculative execution definitely boosts performance. Okay. And so, um, yeah, there's one that was better reliability. All the others were better CPU performance. So, uh, I know, I know how students like, um, if there's two options, like they feel like it should be balanced or something, you know, no, <laughs> not at all. Midterms are mind games. Okay. So all of you guys got this one. Uh, one person didn't know about negative zero. Yeah, that's. One of my favorite features of IEEE 754, you can have negative zero, positive, and negative infinity, um, and nan, not a number, right? Which is different. Um, the fast inverse square root algorithm is a lot faster than computing an inverse square root. Yes, all of you guys got that for computer graphics. Um, yeah. So if, you, if you're compounding interest, if you're doing nuclear reactor stuff, you, you want your accuracy, but for computer graphics, if a pixel value is one pip higher, one pip lower, yeah, you're not gonna notice. You know, and and so as long as you get within one pixel value, um, it, it'll just sort of average out over time. You know, and uh, sometimes if it, it sometimes like you can actually see the, the fast inverse square root in action. Like 
you'll see a bit of shimmering as you walk around as values kind of go up and down like this, like one point. You know, it kind of shimmers a little bit. It doesn't even look bad, you know. And, that, and that's if you're like really looking for it because like one point more red, yeah, it's really hard to see. And if you're doing HDR with a 10 pixel color, 10 bits per pixel, you know, um, it's even harder to see. Okay, so the Q in uh, in neon here means uh, saturating. Okay, doesn't mean quad register here. The instruction with a Q in it means saturate. Okay, the the uh, suffix with a Q in it, yeah, it does mean quad register, but uh, this is this is a saturating uh, add. Okay, uh, what can neon do that base ARM thirty two cannot? Um, it can do vector math, it can convert between floats and integers, it can do square root, and it can do division. Okay. You may be like, wait, what about saturating arithmetic? Yeah, that was a mistake on my part. So that's why I uh, rounded it up. Base ARM32 does have support for saturating arithmetic, mea culpa. So I modified that and gave you all a point on the midterm. Suppose you have a 3D array of unsigned long, long numbers named R of size 100 planes deep, 50 words tall. Wow, a lot of you guys got this one wrong. Okay, so start. you start at 000, right? 000 is that memory address 1000, right? So if I go one column to the right, that's 1008, okay? One more column to the right, 1016, right? So if, if I go down one row, that's 10 columns, so if I go down one row, that's 10 columns of long long, so that's 80 bytes down. So every time I go down a row, I'm adding 80 to the result. And then every time I go down a plane, a plane is 500 long longs. So 500 long longs is 4,000 bytes, right? So I add 4,000 bytes plus uh, 180 bytes. 160 bytes, sorry. Um, 4,000 plus 160 plus 24. 5,184. Okay. Should be able to do that in your head if you want. Okay. That's how I do it usually. And then I'll bust out my calculator and just make sure I didn't, I didn't type it wrong. So use 20 instead of 10 columns. Yeah, that'll do. Yep. So. Um, yeah, this is called row major ordering, and, and it's it it is it is important that you understand it because in C plus plus we use row major ordering. Fortran uses column. Uh, I think they they might actually allow either, but at least Fortran back in the day used column major ordering, where um, columns were bigger steps than rows. But in in pretty much all sane languages. <laughs> Everybody else pretty much uses row major ordering. So every time you go down a row, that's a bigger step than going right a column. Okay. This is the smallest step. This is a bigger step. This is the biggest step. And why that matters to you as a C++ programmer is because you want to stay close to yourself in memory for caching. Because remember, when you grab something from cache, it grabs a line of memory. So if you grab this spot here, it's going to pull in all the people around it. And so as you, if you do a for loop, you want to go through memory in a cache friendly way. If you go vertically, then you're going to get cache misses every time. If you go horizontally, you're going to get a lot of cache hits. And we all know what a big performance difference that makes. So yeah, it, it actually does matter to you. And you will see professional programmers saying things like, um, rewrite your code to be more cache friendly. Like we'll, we'll talk to each other that way. And it makes a big difference. We just don't remember how to do basic arithmetic. Yeah, that's fair. Um, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a mathematician until um, I realized that being a mathematician had nothing to do with doing arithmetic. <laughs> My uh, uncle later on was um, kind of a mathematician. He was like, yeah, we... We make mistakes in arithmetic all the time. <laughs> okay, so assume we have the following memory hierarchy using direct map. We most recently used caches. So 
size and cycle cost. How many cycles does it take to run the following four commands? So LDR 1000 is going to be obviously a RAM hit. That's 100. Let's run to 2000. That is a L1 cache hit. You don't need to hit RAM. You just toss it into cache and let cache percolate it up to RAM. Stores are always cache hits. Right? Just right there. <laughs> uh, LDR 1000. Um, so, so 1000 is going to have knocked out. Let's see. It'll knock out the L1 because they both hash to zero. It'll knock out L2. It'll knock out L3. So that is going to be a... Uh, so this store here knocked it out of L3 cache. So it should be uh, a RAM. It's a total cache miss. So that's a RAM hit, RAM hit, RAM hit. 100, 100, 100. And then that's a L1. So three or four. What is smart cache? I don't know. There, there's a lot of different terms. This smart cache. Where infrastructure meets content. Nah. Caching and hashing are the two big optimization techniques we use in computer science. All right. Uh, we got a pipeline here. Uh, I think 100% of you guys are very close to this, got this right. So. You don't need to do the math on it. Basically, um, there's a pattern when it enters, when it exits, when it enters, when it exits. I think I actually took this from a previous midterm. So, what is wrong with this code? Smart cash, yeah, money, money. <laughs> it's money that has RFID tags on it. Okay, uh, what is wrong with this code? That's actually maybe the direction we'll be going in the future, right? Taggable money, so that you can detect forgeries, right? Just Scan it. I guess you can probably do that already with serial numbers. Okay. Um, all money is an NFT. That's good. That's good. All right. So we're supposed to be taking x multiplying by five and adding five times x times y and adding five times x times y times z. This was, I think, one of your homework assignments. So that looks fine to me. Um, the return value is not being set properly. No, it is. Right there, that's return value. You cannot return from a function with BXLR. No, you can. It's one of the ways you can return from a function. Um, if you're not pushing, popping. Like if if, I, if I'm writing a function that doesn't need push and pop, I'll use BXLR. Uh, it corrupts the registers above R3. Yep, R4 is corrupted, R5 is corrupted. We are not pushing these and we're not popping them at the end. That is something required by um, the ABI, or the, yeah, the AAPCS. That anytime you have a function call, you must save the registers above R3. And we're not. So this is buggy. And it's a very subtle bug because your code will work right. And a lot of times you want to notice that there's a bug because the registers you corrupt aren't being used. So uh, this is why it was worth four points. And yeah, um, it's really important to know that. R4 is not being set to five times X. It is, it is. R4 is, R0 is X, right? R0 is X. And we um, left shift it twice, which makes it four, four times X. And then we add it to X. So X plus four times X is five X. So, yeah. Um, this, this is four points because it tests your ability to read and understand assembly. And then the uh, the programming uh, bits on the the midterm were BXLR results in the entire program ending. Uh, no, it just it just returns. Um, okay. Yeah, this this was the first homework. So yeah, it. it It'll work fine because corrupting the registers didn't matter in that case. All right. What is going on, Nico? Is Nico still there? Nico, you want, yeah. to, you want to offer some but, advice to the students? Uh, sure. The best code is zero code. It's very zen-like of you, Nico. Thank you. <laughs> I was at a, a gift shop over spring break and they were selling Buddhas. 
but they were out. And so it was just like this empty box. And I was just like, that's meaningful. <laughs> <laughs> Playing any good games recently, Nico? Nope. You know how I am. World I'm stuck Warcraft. on the... Stu- yep, yeah, exactly. You yeah. know how bad it is? I got the email to get TBC expansion beta. So, yeah, so, just digging my own grave at this point. Yeah. Who plays that, right, Zach? Yeah, it's not, it's not really good. It's not really a good game, but it is a game that's good for you. So, <laughs> you just gotta look at it differently. Yeah, I, honestly, I think the release of Burning Crusade was the most fun I had in World of Warcraft. Because everybody was in that intro area there. There's a big canyon, and on one side you have the Horde, the other side you have the Alliance. They would kind of like shoot fireballs across at each other. Like, it was... Yeah, it, it, imagine like a building with one door. That's Burning Crusade right there. Just a funnel. Yeah. All right. Um, all right. Uh, yeah, I've been playing Endless Space, Nico, and uh, Endless Legends, and Valheim. Valheim's been a lot of fun. Yeah. I got it. Yeah. All right, see you. What? All right, so uh, last time we talked about dash shared and dash static. So you can choose to make a, you can choose when you compile your code if you're going to make a uh, statically linked thing or a, a shared thing. And um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Um, and so basically a statically linked thing we put into .o files. A shared library goes into SO, a shared object file. Uh, the format's a little different. What's going on here? My mouse engine is updating, really? Okay, no, 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 I don't care about you. All right. Um, and then, uh, yeah, if you if you name something lib something and toss it into, like, a, a whatever directory path that you're looking for libraries in, uh, which you can specify manually with dash capital L, or you can edit various config files to put it somewhere. <clears throat> Then uh, if you do dash lowercase l, it will link in that library. And so if you use dash lowercase l, it will search for something that starts with the word lib. So lib read int, right, <clears throat> would be found with dash l read int. Okay. It's a little, a little wonky, but they don't like typing lib when you don't have to. So um, let's go over some useful Unix utilities. Terrible game that you keep playing. I don't know, you guys, man. Like I, I played a lot of WoW. Like so, I can't really, I can't really talk. But, um, I mean, for me, it was because I just moved to San Francisco, and my friends were all playing it back home, and so it was a way that I could, you know, keep up with my friends. So that was the main reason why I did it. It's a terrible game. It's just not well designed at all. Okay. Uh, all right. So what can we do? What can we do? Um, so if you are into this linking stuff, let's see. So if you want to find out about um, an executable or something, let's see. Yes. So you know you can find out the bob.o is an elf. That's the executable loading format. It's the standard. Um, it's thirty-two bit. Uh, Reallocatable means it can be moved around in RAM. Uh, ARM is the architecture. Extended ABI version five, uh, five version one. Um, it is not stripped of symbols. So um, if it's not stripped of symbols, then we can go bob.o like that, and it will have the um, it'll have the different symbol names in it. Uh, why would you strip? Why would you strip the? Uh, why would you strip an executable? What do you guys think? Size, yeah. So if you compile with dash G, 
say ELF 32-bit, Sunday BI5 version one, dynamically linked, interpreter, um, lib, LD, Linux, ARM, HF, hard float, shared object three, four, GNU Linux 3.2, build ID, blah, with debugging info. So you see how, the de see how it can detect that there's debugging information in there. So file will give you information on these things. Um, read elf. Let's see if I have that installed. So uh, did you see what I did? If you, if you ever have too much text to display on one screen, you can pipe the result of it through less. And less will show you one page of text at a time. So it is ELF32. The data is in two's complement, Little Indian. Do you guys remember what Little Indian means versus Big Indian? the bytes come first, the most significant byte comes first, or the most significant light comes last. Um, that's the difference. So in memory, if you, have, if you load an integer, there's four bytes. Is the most significant byte the first one, or is it the last one? It just depends which order you read. Are you reading right to left or left to right, basically? And um, it's transparent to you in most systems. Like you're not going to, uh, like you're not going to notice any difference uh, if you move to a big Indian system, except when you use the internet. The internet is big Indian. And so you must translate your, anything you send over the internet must be translated to big Indian. That's the standard. So um, there's something called network to host long, things like that, host to network long. And that translates from your Indianness to the internet's Indianness. And if it's the same Indianness, it does nothing. But if it's backwards in it, which, you know, it is, then it puts it in the correct order. That's the main time that comes up. All right. Uh, da, 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 Unix system five. That's an old term. Um, it's an executable. It's on ARM architecture. The entry point is here. So when you launch it, that's the offset that it jumps to to run. Um, where the different headers are, size of the header, then section headers. Like I said, there's a lot of sections. Uh, let's see what we got here. The null got the the minefield of doom. Okay. Um, and if you try reading from memory from here to here, then it will crash your program because you do not have read access on it. Uh, all right. Read only data, it's for globals and things like that. You can read it, you can't write to it. Uh, the data segment, you can read and write to it. Uh, the BSS is globals, read and writable globals. Uh, where's the code segment? Here it is. It's the code segment, you can read from it and you can execute it. Right, so you see how each segment of memory has different permissions on it? <clears throat> and that, that's used for a lot of reasons. Uh, partly it's it's used to prevent the hacks because a common way of hacking back in the day was to do a buffer uh, overflow. And so it would, it would write from the stack down into the code segment and it would overwrite the code segment with um, assembly code. And then you can make the program do whatever you want. And so nowadays text segments are marked as read and execute, not writable. So you can't write to it by accident. A hacker can't write to it by accident, particularly. What else we got here? Uh, read, alloc. Uh, alloc, I guess, is read. Um, execute, registrants into LM group, TLS, compressed, OS specific. Yeah. 
What is MS? Merge strings. Interesting. Okay. So when the uh, when the loader loads this, it's going to be like, aha, we need we need this dynamic library, we need this dynamic library, we need this dynamic library, and we need this dynamic library. Okay, and so it'll it'll load those when you um, launch the program. Let's see if there's anything else interesting here. Relocation section. So relocating relocatable code um, means that it can be re relocated. We put it different memory addresses, and these things use um, uh, relative offsets, like jump 500 to the right rather than absolute offsets. Jump to this memory location. <clears throat> you see how all these things are offsets here. Uh, and then we just got a list of all of the jump slots. And yeah, we're gonna do that. all right, unwind section personality routine. That's what I have. I have a personality routine. Zuckerberg doesn't have that installed, unfortunately. He made made room for other things. He uninstalled his personality routine. Let's see if there's anything else interesting here. Um, symbol table. So I've, I've talked about symbol tables before, but um, this is what a symbol table looks like. It's, uh, it's an array, and it's an array that has every function in it, and it's got the... Um, information about them and things like that. And so if I were to strip this executable, it would pull these names out, right? And so, simple table, so the offsets probably. So if I wanted to call C out, it would jump to, yeah, that there. So if I were to strip the executable and try that again, let's see. see how much less information there was in that. So oftentimes we will strip executables prior to um, prior to releasing them, and and the reason why. Companies will do that is so that people can't um, find out what your program is doing, right? Remember how we did the uh, reverse engineering assignment where you had to uh, re reverse engineer a program? It's a lot harder to reverse engineer something when you don't know what the functions are, right? So you notice in here, we still have like, you know, calls to, you know, the these dynamic functions because we need to know about them, but you can see that a lot of these names have just been removed. And so it doesn't it doesn't reveal information to uh, people that are gonna be reverse engineering our code. And so uh, it's very common for a company to strip an executable uh, to make it harder for people to re reverse engineer it. If you put debugging information and you release it to the world, then they'll know uh, all sorts of information. It might even have a full copy of the source code in it. And a lot of companies believe in not doing proprietary, you know, code uh, or they don't believe in open source code free and open source code and so they will hide the information okay um does that make sense to you guys I'm zero though, which is a bit confusing. What does that mean? Oh, I see, I see. Yeah. Okay. All right. 
NM I've been using a lot, right? This just prints the symbol table, not, not the rest of it. You can see which functions are in your code, which ones are undefined. Um, LDD is useful for seeing what dependencies you have, the loading dependencies, I think it stands for maybe. Loader, load, yeah, the loader dependencies. And so what this does is it sees which shared objects you need to have installed in order for your code to run. And if I were to do something and like make any of these things, like if I made libmath not world readable, uh, then this would um, cause my program to fail. Should I do that? That's really dangerous. Hmm. Do it. Do it. What I'm going to do is throw up in a. I don't remember my password. Ways around it. Okay. So cd into lib arm Linux GNU. There we go. Shmod. Other people may not execute. Read writer execute. Lib m. Aha. So when I try running the program now, it says error when loading shared libraries. Lib m dot so dot six cannot open shared object file no such file or directory so again this is a why static linking is sometimes done your program will stop working if something happens to its dependencies right let's put that back up grant permissions Do you guys know about chmod this turns off permissions this at grants permissions so this says other people um ls dash l lib m so right now, everybody has permissions on this. Ooh, not right access. No, 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 What permissions should it be? Oh, it is set to world. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Let's not have you have access to writing to it. How about that? That'd be very dangerous. Uh, okay, so when you when you talk about permissions, and you got to know this if you're going to be doing any sort of a to unbreak it. Good. Um, anytime you do permissions in Unix, you, you need to understand this. So the uh, the first thing here is for special things like uh, set UID. Uh, the first hyphen. Come on, let me select whatever. The first hyphen there is used for directories. ls dash ld dot. So you'd see the first one is a D if it's a directory or if it's set UID zero. In other words, if the program is set to run as root, then uh, it'll have an S there. Uh, the next three things here is for the owner. So the owner, me, I can run, I can read, and I can execute a dot out. If I do this, uh, chmod user may not execute a dot out. Uh, oops, l a dot out then you will see that the execute bit has been turned off. Whereas before I had the right to execute this program, I do not have permission to execute it now. Okay. So if I try running it, permission denied. Okay. So if I turn the execute bit back on for me, then I can run it. Okay. The, uh, the next three hyphens are for people in my group. So for people in the W Kearney group, Uh, let's see, shown the recurring colon teacher. Yeah. So you'll see, uh, shown is how you change the ownership of a file. So what I did was I said, set the owner of this file to be W Kearney with a group of teacher. And so what I can do is uh, say, let's say there are other teachers on the system. Then I can say, you can run it, but my students cannot. So I could say, show, uh, Chmod. Uh, so I shown it first so that teachers own, their, own it uh, instead of just me. It, most users get their own group just for this this reason. So you don't have to, because everything has to have a group. So so Chmod uh, group may read and execute a dot out. 
so I don't want the other teachers to be able to write to it, but um, I do want them to be able to read it and execute it. You have to be able to read it to execute it, by the way. Um, you can't execute something without reading it. So uh, if there was another teacher on the system, they would be able to run this program, but they could not write to it, okay? Which is maybe a good security measure, right? So I can share something with them, they can run it, but they can't change it. And then for students on the server, uh, that would be chmod other. So user group other, it's called yugo, yugo. So, and you can, I think write that, uh, although I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it that way. Um, so everybody on the server can read this thing, but you guys can't run it, you can read it though. Uh, instead of doing Yugo like that, I would uh, say A. A stands for Yugo. So everybody on the server can read A. So uh, if you guys are going to be Unix people, you need to know Chmod and Shown. That's how you control permissions on Unix. So you learned. You learned something today. I hope. I hope you learned something useful today. They're, I mean, honestly, it's, it's really important to know. Um, okay. What are the Unix things? Are there the dependencies? Uh, strip. Um, yeah, so if we, if we made a shared library and we didn't um, put it into the into the global shared library directory, then it won't be able to find it if you use dash L uh, readint, right? And so you can use dash capital L, dash capital L, like I said last time, can be used to add a directory where you're looking for library files. And dash capital I gives you a directory where you can find your include files. It's very common for projects to have a directory for their include files and a directory for their library files that they make themselves and a directory for source code. So they actually have their headers and their .cc files in different different directories. And then they have another directory where the builds go, where the uh, executables go. And uh, let's see if I have any examples of that on here. Touch selfie, amazing. That's actually a real product. I didn't make that. That was a, um, it's a um, touch screen selfie taking thing, but slightly inappropriate name. So, um, hmm, I don't have any big projects on here. I could probably, I could probably grab the G plus plus source or something like that. Let's take a look at the bridges code. So yeah, so the bridges code is has two directories, include and lib. So if I go into lib, you'll see it's got libbridges.a. And then if I were to, let's say, read elf, um, a libbridges.a, type through less. Um, this is not for the current architecture. You see that? This is for elf 64. Um, can't read the ABI version because this is a, this is for x86, right? And so it's trying to parse this thing, and it it's like uh, I don't know what's going on here, man. Right? So um, file format not recognized, right? So this is this is an x86 or it's a x64 thing. So you can't. This is a library for a Intel. CPU, it will not work on an ARM CPU. Okay. And then in the include directory, you have all your .h files. So. It's pretty common to for people to organize, big projects get organized into different folders like that. Okay. Uh, I don't know what it is, I'm just curious of the naming conventions. What is Chmod, uh, the mode? The mode of, I don't, I don't know, man. Unix, Unix has some wonky naming sometimes. Yeah, the mode, the mode of a, a file is its permissions, right? Um, changes the, 
And, and, and the really annoying thing is the really, really annoying thing is like, let's say you, you, you man it, right? So you say chmod change file mode bits. That does not tell me what it does. Like if I'm a new person to, to, if I'm a new person to Unix, I don't know what file mode bits means, right? And this is something that has irked me for a long time. And the man pages have gotten better over the years, but in general, they expect you know Unix already. And the trouble is like, how do you get to learn and understand Unix? You read the man pages. And so there, it's, it's, like, it's like those Wikipedia pages where like, um, You know, uh, householders methods are a class of root finding algorithms that are used for functions of one real variable with continuous derivatives up to some order D plus one. Oh, now I, oh, I, oh, yeah, okay. Like, really? <laughs> what the hell does that mean? You know, like, I'm coming to Wikipedia so I can learn what this thing is, you know. Some order D plus one. What is D? Okay, each of these methods is characterized by the number D, which is known as the order of the method. What does that mean? The algorithm is iterative and has a rate of convergence of D plus one. What does it mean? You know, Hasselhoff's method is a numerical algorithm for solving the nonlinear equation f of x equals zero. I mean, I know what that means, but I don't know what it means. You know, and so. Like it's, it's an issue I have with like Wikipedia's math pages where like they just kind of assume you know what the stuff is, you know? And so the Unix man pages are the same thing. And, and like Unix people will be jerks about it too, right? If, if, if a, a new person says, hey, hey man, I don't understand what Shmod means, somebody will be like, read the man page. It'll explain everything. And it's like, they, like you can't understand it till you understand it. And then you can understand it. Like I know, I know what it means. I know what this means. But it's utterly unhelpful because it doesn't actually explain what the terminology means. This is this is why I'm so anti-jargon and anti like lingo and and all that kind of stuff because it it, it puts up a wall of understanding, you know, and so it just changes permissions. That's all you have to say. It changes the permissions on a file. That's all you got to say, you know. This this manual page documents the GNU version of Chmod. Okay. Chmod changes the file mode bits of each given file according to mode. Wow, how helpful. Which can either be a symbolic representation of changes to make or an octal number representing the bit pattern for the new mode bits. What the hell is a mode? What the hell is a mode? Doesn't explain it. Right. And uh, the format of a symbolic mode is Yugoa. Uh, Plus minus equals perms, where perms is either zero or more letters that are right. The combination of the letters Yugoa controls like do you think you can get <laughs> right? What's happening from this? Does it have examples? No, it does not have examples. Like all you need to do is like be like, here's how you grant the user you know, read permissions. Here's how you grant somebody in your group, um, how, how you take away write permissions from your group, you know? So these man pages are fine for um, people that know Unix already, but for people learning Unix, they're horrible, right? List symbols from object files. If you don't know what a symbol is, Right, the GNU and M lists the symbols from object file, object file. If no object files are listed as arguments, <clears throat> it assumes a dot dot. Oh, that's cool. So you just get in. Yeah, that's cool. Did not know that. Yeah, I learned something. <clears throat> cool. Yeah. So. Neat. Yeah, so NM dash capital dash capital C demingles the names for you. That's cool. Nice. 
It's a lot more readable. Okay. It's useful. You can learn stuff. Now, that's why I recommend you guys get uh, a book or something like that and just work through um, just work through all the different basic Unix utilities because they're um, there's a lot of them, you know, and at some at some point I, w I will make a Unix class here. The um, pandemic, I've, I've messaged people several times and just I think with the pandemic going on, nothing's happening. And you can't walk by and knock on their office, you know. Um, yeah, so the Sobel book, uh, which you can find for like five bucks, it's got a chapter on like all the different utilities and things like that. So I would just open up this book here to like just a random page. Spell. There is a spell checker. Not, not installed. Okay, cool. Sort is installed. Set is installed. Who, uptime, remove. Yeah, and so basically every day I just kind of open the... I'd open this book to a different uh, LPR. Let's see if I can find schmod. ls-l. Yeah. For seeing the permissions. Of course, there's fsck. No. Okay. So a lot of people think FSCK is a dirty word. It is not. It is file system check. Um, DU gives you uh, let's do DU human. Um, so my directory has 620 megs used in it. So DU is used for disk usage. Uh, DF will tell you how much room there is on the uh, memory card. So the hard drive is 55% full. Date, get the current time. Copy, of course, compare. Shown, okay. And Shamad, here we are. So. So the Savelle book explains Shamad in a way better than that garbage man page, right? Shamad, change the access mode of a file. Okay, that's not helpful, all right. Summary, the Shamad utility changes the ways in which a file can be accessed by the owner, the group, and other users. Um, only the owner can change uh, the access mode and it has a little table saying uh, th this is the user group, other and all. Add, remove, or set permissions. These are the permissions you can set. Uh, you can use octal mode to set them and it's got examples of like, you know, set it so that this guy can do this and this guy can do this. It's like useful. And then there's dash R for recursive. So you can recursively set something to be readable. So like, for example, I have the CHP, the California Highway Patrol alias set up here. And so the CHP alias that I've set up uh, makes everything in the public directory uh, world readable and capital X means set it executable if it's a directory and don't change it to be executable if it's a file. Uh, that, that's actually a more recent uh, addition to Chamod because it was really annoying because um, directories need to be executable for you to stack them. So if I were to uh, for example, chmod the current directory to be um, user may not execute it. Uh, and I try lsing, I can't stat it. I could still run maybe, no, can't even run things inside of it. Um, I, I haven't lost ownership of it, over it, but I can't stat it. And so directories need to be executable in order to stat them. Um, do you guys remember stat? Stat is the um, um, thing that displays 
um, permissions and things like that. That's what ls runs, really. And so stat current directory, can't do it. But I can stat, for example, root, and it'll tell me information on root. And so uh, you need all of your directories to be executable, but you don't want every all the files to be executable. And so what you used to have to do is just chmod, everybody can execute everything. So all the text files are marked as executable, all the directories are marked as executable, and it's just garbage, because everything turns bright green, right? So um, chmod user may execute. That's what I was afraid of. That's why I have you open. <laughs> Present working directory, PWD, CD, directory, CD, home, chmod, user may execute w current. There we go. <laughs> yeah, uh, locking yourself out of your home directory is something I've had students do before. And it's, uh, <laughs> it's unpleasant. Okay. Uh, SL, do I have SL installed in here? I have SL alias to be LS. Uh, RM dash R slash. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So a lot of a lot of useful Unix utilities. Um, and I can stat it now. Yeah. So stat shows me permissions and stuff. Yeah. Access dates. Yeah. All right. All right. So, um, Chmod you, uh, yeah, Chmod you, uh, you have to provide equals or minus or plus. Minus removes permissions. Nobody has read permissions on this. Grant read permissions or set read permissions. Um, yeah, so Unix, very important. Uh, you, you guys only got a few weeks left with me, so I'm trying to cram as much Unix uh, uh, knowledge into your heads as possible because I, I've said this before and I'll say it again. The more Unix you know, the better off you'll be. It's, it's really important to become really competent at Unix, unless you're just going to be a Windows person. If you're just going to be a Windows person, then who cares? Like, don't pay any attention. So, um, yeah, your LD library path. So I've added the current directory to my LD library path. Um, if you don't have that, then when you're compiling, you, you can do that, right? And that would add the current directory. And so it would search the current directory for any of your library files that are missing. But oftentimes when you're in a big project, that it'll be like dash L up up uh, libraries or something. You'll, you'll see something like that. So up a level dot dot means go up a level and then go down into the libraries and add that. So that's where I will look for dot S um, o and .a files. And then my include directory will be in headers. So go up a level and then in the directory called headers, that's where you should search for .h files, right? Any, anything you double, double quote, hashtag include bob.h, it'll look in that directory for you. And uh, this is all important when you guys are going to be working on big projects. Uh, college doesn't really prepare you for working on really big projects because everything we do, you just kind of write from scratch and there's like you know, some code and you like write it and whatever. Um, in reality, like there's a lot of code, you know, and so you need to, you need to get confident and competent at working in working in projects where you don't necessarily know where everything is, right? You go to work for a company. They're like, welcome to the team. Here's our code base. You're going to be working on bridges. All right. It's all header. It's all header files. You know, all right, go to it. Go, go make a, uh, go, go find a bug in the, um, singly linked lists. And you're just like, There's a lot of source code files here. Where, where do I find it? I don't know. I'm just a manager now. Not a programmer. I'm not a magic man. Do you magic things like you? That's what I hired you for. Go fix the bugs. 
Telnet towel blinking lights out SL. Yeah. Telnet's a big security risk. So where is it? Where is the bug? Right? First of all, what it, what bug? Right, let's say um say there's a memory leak. Yep. Say there's a memory leak in bridges, which I think there is. Find and fix the memory leak. Where is it? And this isn't even that many things, right? ls-l, pipe through word count by line. Uh, it's like 60-ish things. There's probably some 59 things in here. Where is it? Where is the memory leak? I'm asking you guys. Where is the memory leak? How do you find it? How do you find the memory leak? polyline.h line 63 <laughs> using ASAN. Yeah, that's actually great. Yeah, so if you uh, if you compile your code with ASAN and run it, it'll it'll tell you what line the, the new is on. So let's open up them polyline.h line 63 and there is nothing there. Cool. Valgrind, yeah. Valgrind is, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, compile your code using Valgrind, ASAN, and grind that, grind those memory. It, it'll tell you where they're allocated, right? And how many times they're allocated and stuff like that. And then once you know where the memory is being nude, then you can figure out why they're not being deleted, right? But anyway, what I'm trying to get at is like, how do you get comfortable with a, with a new code base? Here you are. You're welcome to the Bridges team. You're at UNCC, North Carolina. You've just been hired to work on Bridges full time. <coughs> welcome to the team. How do you get like it, it's a disorienting feeling, right? It's like um, you're, you're being tossed into a pool. Learn it. Where do I even begin? Where's Maine? There is no Maine. They're header files. There's no Maine. Well, what what should I read first? What what you know? I don't know. I'll just pull up a KD tree. That sounds good. I'll just then KD tree and uh, oh, they got comments. That's very nice. It's very nice. Look, they, it's a tutorial and you know KR. Uh, my boy KR did this. Um, and uh, okay, so KD tree inherits from BST. Okay, all right, and it's got comments. That's cool and. I don't know, we can set and get partitioners. I don't know what that means and there's stuff. And it's like, there's a, the point that I'm trying to get at here is that it's a really disorienting feeling. It's like when you start reading like a new sci-fi series and there's like things happening and you don't know what those things mean. And it's like you're, you're being put into a new world, right? Um, what's the guy's Vernon Vidge, the there's this one sci-fi trilogy in which um, the main character was like a group of consciousness. And so it was actually like a pack of hyenas that shared a group consciousness. And so it was saying things like it extended a member around the corner, you know, and you're like, what, what's going on here? And you just, there's this really disorienting, uncomfortable feeling of like, I just don't know what's happening. So how do you dig? You're talking about this dig, or you're just saying you understand, right? Um, a Byzantine error is a yeah, it's a it's like a it's like a, a Heisen bug, right? A Heisen bug is a bug that you look at it and it vanishes, and we don't look at it, it reappears. You know, a, a Heisen bug would be a form of Byzantine error where you're getting these really weird, unproducible, unreproducible bugs that sometimes happen and sometimes don't, and it, and and they cause you to tear your hair out. Um, Dig is the universal response. Yeah, but dig is also Unix command, right? And so if you want to find out information about uh, the internets, then um, run dig and you can uh, find out your uh, uh, DNS things and stuff like that. So yeah, uh, dig csi4x.com. And so you can find out the IP address of the main server. Um, you can dig rpi.csi4x.com and yep, you can 
find out the IP address of the uh, the host here and stuff like that. So, um, so dig is um, useful. It allows you to dig DNS entries up. Uh, who is yeah, who is So yeah, good good Unix utilities there. Um, these um, these three links here are actually pretty good. I'd, I'd go through them if you get a chance. This is in lecture eleven, and so uh, God, Godbolt um, has a really good lecture on the bits between the bits, which is what happens between you compiling a program and the program running. There's a lot of steps that take place. And uh, most programmers have just kind of a vague notion of them. And yeah, watching that's good. Anyway, so what I was going to say is, let's say you want to get, let's say you want to get uh, accustomed to a new code base. Grep is your friend. Grep. It stands for grape. <laughs> uh, it stands for general reg regular expression, I believe. Um, and grep. Uh, it doesn't say what the acronym stands for, but it's like, regular expression, pattern matching, something like that. And grep is the single greatest tool uh, in in the programmer's toolkit for like finding things. It's you can think of it as is in um, in a Visual Studio there's control shift F, which means search across all files. You can think of it as like that, but way better. Okay. So grep allows you to search across all the files for something. So if we find, if we want to just find every place where the word new appears, we can do that, all right? And, uh, and this will give us a list of, across the entire directory, every time the word new appears, okay? And uh, you know these things here are in comments, so, these things here have stars in them. So we can do something like this. We can pipe the results of that through grep dash v backslash star. And uh, it? there we go. And so I just, I just filtered out all of the comments where the word new appeared in a comment. So I don't need those. And I could probably filter out the double slash as well grep dash v means filter out all lines that match something. And so I'm going to filter out everything that has double, uh, sorry, backslash. I might have to quote it like that. Back, back tick, backslash, sorry, not back tick. Backslash quotes a character. And so you have to quote the star. You have to quote the, uh, the slash characters. And you'll see here we've got that line there. And now, now we do not. So I filtered out all the times the word new appears in a comment. And so now we have a list of how many? I don't know. Pipe the results of that through word count dash L. And you can see there are 15 news and bridges. So if we are memory leaking, these are our suspects. These are the people who are potentially causing trouble. Okay. Remember the rule of the Sith. For every new, there must be a delete. Right, and so if anywhere within this code there's a new that doesn't have a matching delete, then um, we need to put the delete in there, right? And so, did you guys see how quickly I was able to identify the 15 candidates for this, right? And uh, return pointer, and so a lot of these are an SIO message. Okay. Um, Godbolt on YouTube. Yeah, Matt Godbolt of the, the New England Godbolts. Yes, he uh, he gave the talk. And uh, it's a good talk. He's a, he's a really smart dude. Um, global regular expression print. Yeah. So, um, yeah. 
So, yeah. Boom. New programmer. There's a memory leak. Find it. Okay. You know, now, now my work begins, right? Now I'm going to go through each one of these things. Um, <laughs> if you want to see something even more sick than this. Uh, all right. Let's open up all the files with, that has a new in it. How about that? You guys want to see how to do that? Like I said, this is this is better than Visual Studio because in Visual Studio you just Control F new, but then it's going to return all of the lines that in the comment it says new and stuff like that. Uh, grep is Grep is amazing. It is the best way of getting a grasp, of get, getting a handle, getting to understand a, a code base. Okay, so if I pipe the results of this through cut, cut cuts out vertical columns of text, and you're like, what vertical columns? Yeah, all I want are the file names. Okay, so I'm going to cut out the first field, field one delimited by the colon character. Okay, so that means uh, we have a colon delimited file. And so give me the first column. See that went from this. So everything after the colon is gone now. Uh oh, is my thing freezing? Am I freezing? Is freezing? Freezing is hello? Hello? All right, well, my webcam just died in the middle of class, I guess. We're just keep going. Um, right. And so this will, and, and there's actually a command in grep, I believe. Grep, just print the file name. Uh, file name, file name, file name. I think there's a way of getting grep to do this, but either way, it's going to show you the power of Unix. So uh, that's the list of all the file names, and then I can pipe the results of this through unique and that eliminates duplicates. And so these are the um, six files that have news in them. And let's see if I pipe that through them. Then uh, let's see here. And so now Vim is opening up each one of those files. You guys see that? So find everybody uh, in the directory, strip out everything that has a comment, uh, get me just the file names, unique the file names, and then for each one of those file names, run Vim on it. And there you go. And then I can search for new and all this kind of stuff. Okay. Elvis. <laughs> so four more files got it. Okay. What do you guys think? Like Vim dash P. What does Vim dash P do? Uh, can you open them with syntax highlighting this way? It's coming. It's coming from the input rather than um, rather than a file. And so, let's see. Yeah, there's a command to turn on syntax highlighting. Uh, quick fix. That's cool too. Yeah, there, there's a way you can turn on syntax editor. Yeah, and so you, if you know grep, you can you can find um, you can find things using very complicated, very interesting patterns throughout your source space. So grep um, doubly. So let's say that there's a bug in the doubly linked list class, right? And I'm looking at this thing and I don't see anywhere within here doubly linked lists, right? I don't, I don't know. I see this, this might be a single list element, but that's not a double, right? 
So there's a circular double. Maybe that's it. I don't know. But if you want to find every place in your source code where the word doubly appears, you just grep doubly star, and then boom. This class we used to instantiate a circular doubly linked list. There's a tutorial about doubly linked list. Okay, so that is the one right there. I must have missed it. Oh, yeah, it's very the very bottom right there. Do you guys see how that works? If you want to um, you know, find out where the rocket launcher is, you grab a uh, you know, rocket and search that way. Grab um, color. Right? So every time the word color appears. Yeah. And see, so you can use grep to um, get a handle on your, your code. Okay. It's so, so useful. And um, um, I don't know, it, it's not really that scary. Like at, at, the, at the basic level, um, you know, you just search for a word across all files, right? Why is this in, why is this in overwrite mode? And so if I want to find all the files that uh, KR worked on, um, do it this way. Yeah. So, Check for Eric Sully also. So what what files did both KR and uh, Sully work on together? You guys see that? So, um, yeah, honestly. You're, you're going to be dumped at some point into a giant code base and not know where stuff is. So um, that's the best way of getting um, acclimatized to new code base. Any questions about that? Okay. Yeah, grep. Um, diff. Have we gone over diff before? Okay, so let's say um, let's say I want to know what the differences are between um, two students homeworks. So let's say if I want to see the difference between Muya's and uh, and. Guzman. Okay, if I do this, it's going to this is going to do a directory comparison. So it's going to compare all the files in one directory with all the files in the other directory. And um, you can see that their make file is a little bit different. Uh, Muya has a dash G, Guzman does not. Um, one of them has this, right? And so I can. I can see, uh, there's also, what is it? Uh, sdiff. Yeah, so I can sdiff their files and it will show like a side-by-side -side comparison of their code. Okay. And uh, you can see that Muya had this and Guzman does not. And, so it's a side-by-side -side comparison. And so the areas without any marker here are the same. And then you can see uh, this one has this, but this one does not. So if you just scan down the middle, you can see where the differences are between one file and another. And so I use this to determine if students are cheating, for example. So it's called diff. But in computer science, um, let's say you've got two different files Right. Uh, let me switch over to um, 
the real server here. And so I've got my colors, uh, colors, colors, yeah. So I've got my cool uh, color setter file here that um, uh, is my in cursor replacement. I've got stuff in it. And I want to know, have I updated diff colors.h with public slash colors.h, although I don't need to type that. If I don't type it, it just uses the same file name. So, oh, oh, they are not the same. Look at this. It looks like the second file, the one, the one in public is actually more recent. You see that? The right file has code that the left file does not. And so we need to update. So copy slash public colors dot h to here. Okay. And so when you're doing coding, you can use diff to see which file is more recent, right? What you know, or maybe if two different people work on the file at the same time, you'd see, okay, this person wrote this function in one, this person wrote that function in the other, and you can use diff to uh, merge them, basically. Um, there's also commands called patch that will actually uh, apply a diff. So I could actually save the results of that diff and um, and actually, uh, I can actually pipe that into patch and it'll actually update update a file. Or you can save the results of the diff. You can save the results of the diff into a file. And then you can distribute that patch to people. And then that's how you can like update Steam, right? If you guys ever seen like Steam updating, like what it does, it diffs your current release with the old release and it saves the results into a patch file. It's more complicated than this, but that's the basic idea. And then all you have to do is, okay, there's no difference right now. Let me modify it. Uh, public, uh, colors, H. And so if I do a diff now, you'll see the left file uh, in the current directory has this, the right file is this. And so what I can do is I can actually just write this into a patch file. And then rather than having to distribute the entire colors.h, which is, you know, 11K, um, I can just distribute the patch file, which is 88K or 88 bytes, sorry. Do you guys see that? You guys understand? So uh, diff will generate these things, which means delete this, insert this, basically. And, uh, and then you just run patch, you know, I don't remember the exact syntax, I rarely do it. But yeah, so you can, you just run patch and apply a patch file to, um, to a file. And there's also that's a merge. Yeah. Man diff three, which is a three-way diff. So this is useful if you want to diff your code against another student's code against my code. So I, I push out a reference implementation and then I want to see what the differences are between two students ignoring my code essentially. So uh, diff three is very useful again for, for that. But just in terms of like coding, we use diff all the time. Like what, what changed from one version to the next, right? Uh, oh, uh, we should go over Git, huh? Ooh, yeah, let me, let me talk about this. So I could uh, try to do this from my memory, which I probably could but um, I don't trust my memory necessarily. So there is a command in Unix called history. History will show you all of the commands you've done ever, right? And uh, as you can see over here, I became a student and over here I became the student again. And here I'm looking at what mistakes Blanc has made on a homework summit, that kind of stuff. So it has 10,000 different commands in my history. And so I do know that somewhere within that history, I have updated my GitHub page with the latest version of colors.h. 
what I'm going to do is, well, actually, why don't you guys do it? How do I, how do I, I could do last git, which you know, is git push, not very useful. Um, how do I see what git commands I have run in the past? How do I do that? Oh, I already got it. All right, so uh, grep git, yeah. And so this is my git history, right? So uh, git, <laughs> nice typo there, fantastic. Um, and so you can see, and, and you see in the past, I did the same thing, right? <laughs> history pipe through grep git, very good, Rivera. And so rather than me having to do that, um, it looks like it doesn't actually have the code. So my history probably got cleared at some point then. It's unfortunate. All right. So git add uh, colors.h, uh, git print, um, added bug fix for double clicking. And then we do a push. Daddy, mommy needs you. Mommy needs me. And then uh, I have updated it on GitHub. And so if we come over to GitHub, I'll be there in a second. Bro. Okay. Oops. And so then if you go to my project site, you can see, look at that, colors.h got updated a minute ago, added a bug fix for double clicking the mouse. How far back does history go? It's a it's a configurable property. Um, so I saved the last uh, 10,000. So my last 10,000 commands. So I've I type a lot of commands. Okay, uh, I'll be right back. My wife needs me. Okay. All right, so what other Unix stuff should we talk about? We got 15 minutes left. Um, hmm. Mm -hmm. Aachen said, pretty useful stuff. So if you ever wanna do like a, um, a big manipulations uh, beyond like what you can do with the uh, simple stuff you can do with the Unix utilities. Um, there's a program called sed and uh, like this we'll do a search and replace on a file. Um, <clears throat> how to gonk, change it from gonk to geek, how to geek. Um, Coleridge. Oh yeah. It, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. <laughs> Great Iron Maiden song. Uh, pull out lines one through four. Uh, there's a lot of stuff you can do with sub. Let's scroll down. Uh, so, yeah, there's it, it's called Stream Editor. And so you can basically write a program that will modify a text file. And there's a lot of very complicated stuff you can do with it. So, substitute. Um, lowercase d or uppercase d ay with week global day after day day after day changes into week after week week after week um yeah you can you can spend a whole thing on said awk is fairly similar to that uh kill kills a program um let's see Oh, Ellen. Yeah, we can talk about Ellen. Sure. So let's Ellen diff wheeler to be Bob. So if I vim diff wheeler, you'll see this stuff here. And if I vim Bob, you'll see this stuff here. It's exactly the same, right? Ellen works just like copying except it's actually the same file. So what happens is that when you link a file together, this is like a shortcut 
in, in, in Windows. So when you use LN, it makes a copy, but it's not a copy. It doesn't actually, if I were to edit uh, Bob, for example, and put in stuff here, and then I were to edit Wheeler, you see it's still there, right? It's actually the same file. And uh, Bob here is executable. Why are you executable? Chmod, uh, all may not execute Bob. Here. And uh, yeah, so file Bob. Hmm. To stat Bob, maybe. Inode one three 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 six eight stat diff Wheeler. Inode one three 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 six eight. See that links two. Whereas if we were to stat um, diff uh, Watson, you'll see that there is one link. So when you use ln, you create a new link to a file, it's called a hard link. And so basically um, it's a, it, it refers uh, to the same inode. An inode is just an integer, but that's like the file number on disk, right? So you can see that Bob is 1333368, uh, Wheeler is 1333368. They both refer to the exact same file on disk. And it notes that there are two links to it. So if I were to remove Bob, it doesn't actually delete the file. If I were to remove Bob, and then stat Wheeler, you see that there's now one link to it. Okay, a file only gets removed when there are no links remaining. All right. Um, yeah, but Bob works just like um, a regular file. So if I were to um, delete Wheeler instead, remove um, diff Wheeler instead can't stat it anymore, but if I stat Bob, you'll see that Bob still points at that same inode on disk and there is down to one link now. Okay. So this is something called a hard link. Okay. We don't use hard links that often. Uh, it can be useful though. Like if you want to um, have a file that all the students can read from and you want them all to have just a copy of that file in their local directory, there's absolutely no reason why it should be a copy. Right, like if you're gonna have some um, move Bob to be diff. Um, like let's say uh, I'm gonna push out a copy of uh, mountain.jpg to all of you guys. There's absolutely no reason why I should copy it to all of you because it's the same JPEG file, right? So what I could do is instead of copying it, I could ln it. And if I ln it, then all of you guys have a uh, copy in your own directory, so it's convenient. You don't have to be like all, you know, Sadie, you know, slash public slash mountain. You don't have to do that. It's like in your local directory. But uh, I don't know if that even works. I wonder if that broke something. But yeah. Um, the uh, the point is, is like you can deploy copies to people <laughs> that aren't actually copies. And as long as they're all read only, then you won't even notice. It just looks like a regular file in your directory and you're good to go. Now, uh, the more common use of LN, LN works just like copy, right? Except it doesn't actually copy it. <laughs> it just looks like it copies it. Um, there's LN-S and that can be used for directories as well. So if I were to do uh, LN-S slash public to be public like this, that is what it means in the current directory. Then when I type ls here, you'll see that there is now a link here. The uh, Notice how that's a new color. It's like that light, light blue color. Dark blue is for a folder. Light blue is for a link. And if I cd into it, da-da, I'm in slash. Um, ah, damn it. I did, did I do that backwards? I probably did that backwards. Uh, public. The infinite loop. Uh, oh, I am in public. Okay, cool. Yeah, it, it just shows it as being in my public directory instead of my home directory. But I'm actually in slash public. And so if there's like some directory I'm always going to, like user, lib, you know, uh, you can do an ln-s 
uh, user lib um, Who do I care about? I don't really care about anybody, do I? Um, I care about you guys, but these directories I don't care about. User lib games now. to here. Yep. And so I can CD into games, and now I'm in user lib games. So it's a shortcut. All right, so ls-l. You can see I've got, I do have a shortcut for turnin.dust, so I can CD into that to go into the turnin directory that all of your homework's in. I've got a shortcut for public, it takes me into slash public. Got a shortcut for games that takes me to user lib games. And so ln s is, um, it, it creates a shortcut, basically. Now, uh, if I delete the original thing, this will stop working, right? So it's, it's just a convenience kind of thing. So ln works like copy. Okay. okay. Um, Seven minutes left. Talk about R, maybe. Um, great modifying extract from archives. Check some. So check some will give you a check some number on a executable. And so if somebody ever gives you an executable, they can say the check some value on it. And um, that will verify that the file that you got is the file they sent. So if somebody were to try to intercept uh, something in transit and switch it out with something else, you can verify that the checksum checks out. Now, of course, the problem is like, how do you know that the checksum you get is correct? You know, so. So I'll check out Omar's library. So he sends this to me. He says, here's the checksum on it. And um, as long as, you know, that's maybe in a publicly posted place, then you can, whatever you download, you can verify that the checksum is correct on it and that nobody's modified it. It's useful for if you don't trust your download site, you know, but let's say that somebody has a mirror set up. You can go to Putty and get the checksums on Putty. Let's see here, Putty. So they have a website that have their keys on it. I go to download and you click on the signature. Great. <laughs> Great. So that's the problem, right? Is that you're trying to get the signature in. So, um, all right, see so anyway. All right, so let's talk about R, I guess. Um, As I said on here, this is how you do it. So um, RCS, yeah. AR RCS, Bob.A, star.O, and then congratulations, you now have it. You now have an archive file that contains an M Bob. You have an archive file that contains all the different, you see this, the archive file is just, it's literally just the different files smacked together. So we got bob.o, we got helper.o, we got loop.o, multidim.o, nomain.o, print hello. They're all just smashed together into a thing. So they are pretty easy to use. Um, so where's the one that prints it? Yeah, AR prints it. ARPV. Yikes. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, so you can put people in. 
insert table. Okay. So this lists all the different members of the archive. So it's just like a, a zip kind of thing, you know. So you basically zip up a bunch of .o files. I don't think it compresses though, does it? Um, if you want to compress files, there's a command called tar, which is tape archive. So AR is archive, tar is tape archive. It's not like we uh, use tapes really anymore. It's now just an archiving utility. Also, but uh, tar can do compression. So if I wanted to, for example, um, take um, this bridges, it's already tar. Let's pretend that doesn't exist. Remove bridges, because this is how, I mean, this is literally how we distribute things, right? So if I want to send a copy of a directory to somebody, I would do this. Tape archive, um, um, yeah. uh, bridges.tar, bridges that. And so what this is going to do, it's going to, um, it's going to create a zip file, basically, except it's not compressed. I'll, I'll show you how to compress it in a second. So uh, we've got all that uh, stuff in that directory there. And now all of them have been added to the tape archive. The reason why I printed everything is because I chose verbose. C means create, F means files, uh, something like that. And tar, uh, the commands are regular files. There's a lot of options for these ones. Whatever. So then I can gzip it. gzip bridges.tar and uh, ls bridges.tar.gzip, right? And so uh, let's gunzip it. Uh, gunzip. It deletes the original file when you do that. Bridges.tar.gzip. And so ls dash l bridges.tar. So before the thing was uh, 8 megs, after compressing it, it's 1.5 megs. You guys see that? So gzip is how you compress a file. Now you can also do it, uh, remove bridges.tar. You can also do it directly from tar itself, tar cvfz bridges.tgzip file. So you do it all at once, bridges that. And so that will actually add all the things into the tape archive. And um, you'll see it's basically the same thing. So. A TGZ thing is the same as .tar.gzip, uh, more or less. It's just made directly from tar rather than using the gzip utility separately. And so the command for that is tar cvfz, um, the name of the tar file to create, and then you can either use a directory or if I wanted tar mm, bob.tgz, cvfz, bob.tgz. I could just add all of my current CC files to it. And then all of my .cc files are now added to a compressed archive and I can move bob.tgz to old source code.tgz. And you can see that it, it's, a, it's a very easy way of just packaging up lots of files and compressing them. And then I can just email this to somebody, mail, Bob Hotmail, redirecting in old source code. And so I can just mail in the, the TGZ file. It does lose a bit of human action. I know, I, I just mailed Nico. Let's see, Nico just responded. Uh, Ouch, I need your work laptop asset and serial codes. I still have yours, right? When you have the schools, that is correct. It is now kaput. Yep. So hopefully I'll get a, get a new webcam for you guys. Can TGZ's files be used with GNZip? Uh, that's a good question. Um, GNZip old source code. TGZ. Uh, yeah. So it went from old source code TGZ to old source code tar. And uh, if you vim a tar file, it'll actually open up all the different files in there and then you can select them 
Vim can actually read a tar file. Gzip old source code. I wonder if we can Vim old. Yeah, and Vim can actually open up a um, a tar file that's compressed. So inside of Vim, I can come in here and um, browse around inside of a compressed tar file. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Yeah, so tar.gz is basically the same as tgz. Um, yeah. So uh, this is how we distribute files on the internet. Like you saw the Bridges people, they sent this out as a tar file. Can I modify them within the tar? Good question. Um, yep. Why not? Yeah, pretty cool. Pretty cool. So the 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 tar gzip file format is the standard. And and like when I was in college. We would literally submit our homework by just, we'd have everything in a directory. Oh, I can see here. We have everything in a directory, and then we would just, um, let's go into the build. And whatever, you know, we would basically just uh, package up all of our source code and mail it to the professor. And that was how we did our homework. So you just, um, they didn't have the auto grader that I made. Um, and so a lot of times you would just either run a command that would submit your, you would, you would, you would make a tar file, then you'd run a command to submit it, or you just email it to them or something like that. All right. Well, that's it for today, guys. I hope you enjoyed this journey into Unix. Um, hopefully there's something from that that you can use, um, yeah, you can see the students in this class were submitting projects that way. Okay. And so uh, you've got a lot of reading due tomorrow, and then you've got the hash table assignment due next Tuesday. So uh, the, uh, the homework itself, you don't need an input tester for it. The homework itself will tell you if the code is correct. And if it's not correct, then output the output the things and see why your things don't match the C++ things. All right. See you guys and have a great day.